go to the places I normally do. But through COVID, I found new ways to travel that are honestly more environmentally sustainable. The first way was exploring my own community. So my mom was the typical quarantine mom. She fit all the stereotypes. She wanted to go on a walk every single day. And whether it was around our little neighborhood or exploring the community through hiking, we spent like hours trekking up Breakneck Hill, on the bike trail, finding cute little trails, even the Appalachian Trail that goes all over the place in Brewster. And for me, that was something that was really new. I had always kind of thought of Brewster as this little small town, you know, there's not a ton to do here. But by exploring the natural beauty of the town, I found a lot more to value here. The other thing that was great, beyond just the natural beauty of exploring your own community, was all the time I spent with my family. Now, my family is crazy busy. We're always running from different sports practices, my mom works, my dad coaches. So we honestly, while we value family time together, didn't really get a chance to spend a lot of it before quarantine. And here he did. We also had my cousin Lauren, who came up from the city to stay with us for a two week quarantine and ended up staying for two months. And so she spent a lot of time with us too. But during these family walks, during our time that we spent together hiking, I learned from other generations, like I normally do from other cultures when I travel. And then we also went after this and visited my grandparents for a while after being quarantined for a while. And they too taught me like other cultures do when I'm going to travel about other generations. The second way I found was virtual travel. So the last two summers, I've gone on what is essentially a mission trip to different places around the world in the summer. And I've done community service there, but also been able to travel. And a lot of people ask, like, why would you do community service in another country when you could do it here in Brewster or anywhere in the United States? But for me, going to these other places and learning from the people I was working with in these communities was just as important as doing the actual community service. So this year, I couldn't go on one of those trips again, but one of my friends reached out to me and she had been intending to go to Ethiopia to tutor kids in English. And instead, we started tutoring them virtually. So for the, over the summer, I spent one day a week tutoring kids. I had two 14-year-old boys, Barnabas and Baruch, that I would work with every week and tutor them in English. But at the same time they were tutoring, or I was tutoring them in English, they were teaching me all about Ethiopia. They were teaching me about their culture, their landmarks. They even taught me how to say certain words in Amharic, but uh, I'm definitely not pronouncing them right. But they tried, you know? And so through this virtual medium, through Zoom, honestly, I was able to connect with people across the globe. People I never would have talked to just staying in Brewster. So how does this all factor in to the environment? Well, one thing you have to understand about climate change is that humans are the ones causing it. There's honestly not any question about that. And for any of you who've taken an environmental science class or even most science classes, you've probably heard about something called the greenhouse effect. Now this is a natural process. And basically what happens is the sun hits the earth and some of that light, some of that heat is absorbed by the earth, by the land, by the oceans. But a lot of it is reflected back into the atmosphere. So if there was no greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, it would just go back into space. And some of it does. But a lot of the light is trapped by this layer of greenhouse gases, methane, CO2, um, water vapor, and it's trapped inside the earth. And it's what makes us able to live on this planet. Without this effect, we wouldn't be able to live here. The problem is, with all of humans, with all of the humans doing what they do and releasing the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, this is working way too well. So this is an indication of CO2 levels and temperature over the last few years. CO2 is the most important greenhouse gas. It's not necessarily the most potent. I think methane is like 21 times more potent. But humans release so much CO2 into the atmosphere and it stays there for thousands of years. So this is the last hundreds of thousands of years. And as you can see, CO2 is a really good indicator of temperature. And as you can see, 
temperature fluctuates throughout the globe. CO2 rises, CO2 falls, and so does temperature. So you would think that maybe this warming would be natural. Here's the problem, it's not. <laughs> so these are CO2 for the last couple years. This is CO2 today. Oh. Yeah. So this is CO2 today. So this is the Industrial Revolution. That's today. CO2 has skyrocketed, skyrocketed because of human activities. It's not just a natural pattern like it has been. This is, again, hundreds of thousands of years in a natural pattern. And this is because of humans. So, what does this mean for temperature? It means temperature is skyrocketing. Over the last, since 18, 80, temperature has gone up one degree Celsius. Since 1975, there's been 75% of that one degree Celsius. And as we continue up, it continues to grow at an even faster rate. The other thing is, CO2 is being put into the atmosphere by humans at an alarming rate, but it's also just like sitting there because it doesn't go away for thousands of years. So not only do we need to stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere, but we really need to figure out a way how to get it out of there. How does this relate to travel? So, one of the leading causes of CO2 emissions is transportation. It is the leading cause in the United States. Now, this isn't just planes, this is cars and vehicles, but CO2 is being caused by transportation, by travel. Now, if we just alternate between traveling virtually, traveling in our own community, and traveling internationally, it would reduce it so much. So during COVID, there's something called Earth Overshoot Day. And that's when the day that we use more resources than we can handle on that year. When we use more Earths, essentially, than we can reproduce in that year. This was the Earth Overshoot Day in 1970. We used a little bit more earth than we needed. Right now, it's all the way down. Now during COVID, it went back. It went back to August 22nd. It was almost three weeks that it shot back. And that was when we weren't traveling to work by cars, when there weren't planes flying, no one was traveling, everyone was staying home. If we can do this, even just a little bit, it would help our planet so much. Now there's something called you can calculate your own personal Earth overshoot day, and most Americans live with way more Earth than they need. They use three or five Earths. When I cut my travel time just in half, using all of the same factors, I use one less Earth, an entire one less Earth. And that's just cutting it in half, that's not eliminating it. So what I want you to take away from this is that Will I get on the plane and travel soon? Probably. But will I also know that I can travel in my own community, I can travel virtually, I can supplement my travel to help this? Absolutely. And you should too. You should take advantage of your own community. You should take the lessons you, I know COVID was awful, but you should take the lessons you learned from COVID and apply them to your life now. Thanks.